that I love, um, and representing a community that I really, really love. So um, I'm very happy to be back here looking at all of you, so many of whom are my friends and colleagues, even if it is in a, a somewhat different capacity. Um, well, I think Frank and Karen have done an excellent job of laying out uh, the lay of the legislative lay of the land. So I want to talk to you a little bit about what the House Immigration Subcommittee is doing um, in terms of doing our part to build the momentum towards comprehensive immigration reform and to get us ready for action, um, hopefully, not if, but when action becomes necessary. So as you know, while uh, these discussions are happening in the Senate, um, quite frankly, the folks in the House for the last 12 years have not had an opportunity to think about comprehensive immigration reform in a positive fashion. For folks in the House, it's very much been more offenses, less offenses. More offensive anti-due process enforcement measures or less offensive anti-due process enforcement measures. So it really, the House of Representatives has not had a chance to really think about comprehensive immigration reform and what it means to America and what it means to our communities. So what we're trying to do at the House Immigration Subcommittee is to give our folks a chance to have that sort of logical discussion. And I just want to contrast our efforts this year with the efforts that the House engaged in last year. Because as you know, the House also had many, many hearings, uh, many of them in the field, um, ostensibly on immigration reform. But very much they used hearings as a way to defer and actually really entirely try to scuttle comprehensive immigration reform. It was their way of not dealing with the issue head on. Our approach, I'm very happy to say, it's just the opposite. Ms. Lofgren is very much about educating the House of Representatives and really using these hearings as building blocks to educate our members on what comprehensive immigration reform means, how different elements of comprehensive immigration reform really is good for our country, for our economy, for our families, for our communities, and to build up the, legis build up the momentum and the knowledge base that is going to be necessary for our members to take sometimes are what are facially at least very difficult votes on immigration reform. So just to start, um, we started a, a series of hearings on comprehensive immigration reform and we started we started them, rightly enough, at Ellis Island, where 12 million immigrants came through. Um, and it, it, I learned a lot of very interesting things putting these hearings together. One of them is that 40% of uh, the current US population can tra actually trace their roots back to the, folk, the 12 million folks who came in through the Ellis Island. And we felt that that was very much the right place to affirm the importance of immigration to our country and the lasting effects, mostly good effects, that immigration has had on the foundation of our country. We talked about, we had an economist come in and talk about the economic needs for future ongoing immigration. We had a demographer come in and talk about the demographic, our changing, our changing and aging population and the continuing need for new workers into the United States in order for us to continue having a vibrant economy. We had a historian, again, rightly enough, in the context of Ellis Island, to talk about the fact that this, we've done this over and over again. We've had wave after wave of immigrants, you know, be they the Irish or the Italians or, um, you know, other Southern Europeans. And each time, there was always somebody to say, wait a minute, they're different from us. They look different from us. They, they sound different from us. They don't speak English and they will never be Americans. And each time, these, what, whichever the population was, remarkably became the most loyal immigrant, most loyal Americans and have added to the rich and vibrancy of our community and our country. Um, we then turn from that to look at the different, what we're calling flashpoints. The questions that people who are not as conversant with immigration issues ask about comprehensive immigration reform. Isn't this amnesty? Isn't this, why aren't these people speaking English and assimilating? Isn't this chain migration? So what we're trying to do in each of our hearings is to answer these questions. 
to give comfort to our members, again, who may be afraid, because they just don't know very much about immigration, to really educate them on these flashpoints and say, you know, there's answers for all the questions that you are concerned about. And the answers are generally very good. Immigrants do add to our economy and make us more vibrant. Immigrants do assimilate, actually, at a quicker rate than ever. Immigrants do contribute to the great fabric of our community, particularly the family-based immigrants. So we're trying to address between now and uh, to the end of May all of these important issues and build up a comfort level for our members. Um, and that's, that's our plan. And hopefully while we're doing that, um, our colleagues in the Senate will do the right thing and come up with a bill that we could all take up come July. Hi friends, it's it's really a <coughs> excuse me. It's really a great honor to be able to um, talk to you and to have been invited to speak to you, and also to share a panel with with uh, the people that are on my right and left, who are um, who are really an inspiration to me. Um, and I'm here to. My name is Josh Bernstein, and I'm with the National Immigration Law Center, and I've been asked to speak specifically about the prospects for the DREAM Act. Um, as you know, the DREAM Act is for young people who are brought to the United States as children, as undocumented children, and who have since grown up in the U.S. And basically the DREAM Act says that if you um, remain in school, graduate from high school, um, have good moral character, were brought here years ago as a child, then upon high school graduation you can get a um, temporary green card called the conditional status. And then in the next six years, if you either go two years, go to college for at least two years or serve in the military, then you can get a permanent green card. And you're able to, um, to then get on with your life, contribute fully and work, etc. Um, right now is a somewhat of an awkward period for advocacy for the DREAM Act because Everything that we do right now is a little bit overshadowed by the big events that, that the other three speakers spoke about. And everybody's attention is riveted on the comprehensive immigration reform. As they mentioned, and I just want to just review, there are basically are three possible outcomes of the comprehensive immigration debate. One possible outcome is that we end up this year with a just comprehensive immigration reform bill that passes Congress and signed into law. If that happens, there's no doubt in my mind, and I think in most of our minds, that the DREAM Act will be part of that, and so that these young people will be able to be taken care of in the context of that comprehensive, just comprehensive bill. Another possibility is that our efforts could go south, and something that we really could not support could become law. We don't really want to think about what, whether the DREAM Act would be included in that. There, you know, we don't want a bill that passes as Frank was saying, we don't want a bill that includes, uh, that's unworkable and that might set us up for years and years in the future, decades in the future with provisions that we regret and that actually hurt our communities rather than helping them. The third possible outcome is that comprehensive immigration reform doesn't pass at all. Um, that's, we don't want to admit that and we don't want to think about it, but we have to admit and we, as um, wise people have said, you hope for the best but you also plan for whatever else could happen besides the best. And so if comprehensive immigration does not pass, at the very least, we hope, and I think that many of us share, that we hope that the DREAM Act is at least something that we can come out of this year with. The DREAM Act kids, when, you're ta when you go around next, um, uh, in the next days and talk about immigration reform, the DREAM Act kids who were graduated from high school the first year that the DREAM Act was first introduced in 2001, are now 24, 25 years old. There's a whole nother generation of young people in high school, 700,000 people in K through 12, who will benefit from the DREAM Act once they graduate from, from high school. But if we delay, they will also get older, and it'll be harder and harder for them to go to college and realize their full potential. The DREAM Act kids cannot wait until Congress gets it all right. Um, 
So we have to continue to work even in the shadow of, 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 the, of all of the work that we're doing on comprehensive immigration reform. We have to work on trying to pass the DREAM Act and raising this, making people aware of the DREAM Act and making sure that it will be able to pass if comprehensive immigration reform doesn't or else in the context of comprehensive immigration reform. When you go around to members of Congress and you mention the DREAM Act, you might find out that they're going to give you a little bit of pushback. And usually it will not be because they don't support the DREAM Act, although some members of Congress and their staffs are a little bit confused about what the DREAM Act is, and you can help clear that up for them so that they know what it is at stake. But we've been hearing a lot in the last weeks, members of Congress saying, acting as though there's a competition between, let's say, the STRIVE Act on the one hand and the DREAM Act on the other. And so some members and some staff will tell you, well, we're not going to uh, co-sponsor the DREAM Act because we co-sponsor the STRIVE Act, as though you could only do one or the other. Okay? The DREAM Act is part of the STRIVE Act, and you can support both of them by, by co-sponsoring both of them, and that's something that you should under, understand. Um, if, if they are like that, if, if members of Congress treat you like that on this or on the family issue, if you are disrespected, which is not very common, but which does happen, remember that you should not become um, discouraged by that because this is something, your presence here is very powerful, it's very rare for members of Congress to hear from people like you. All you need to do is to persevere and you will be successful. Why am I optimistic that actually, even if comprehensive immigration reform doesn't pass, that the DREAM Act will pass? Well, let's just start with um, Tracy's boss, Zoe Lofgren. Every time Zoe Lofgren talks about comprehensive immigration reform, she also talks about the DREAM Act. She mentions the DREAM Act and she says, she has said several times in public and in private, that if the DREAM Act is not included in comprehensive immigration reform, she will walk. That's very powerful. She's probably one of the most important people in Congress with, for the DREAM Act. Her boss, not her boss, but the chair of the, of, the of the Judiciary Committee, who's the next in line, Mr. Conyers, also is committed to, to supporting the DREAM Act. The Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, is also a previous co-sponsor and big supporter of the DREAM Act and frequently mentions it in her talks about immigration. In the Senate, Senator Durbin, the sponsor of the DREAM Act in the Senate, is the person who is, the, is also the second in command among Democrats and although Senator Durbin is always raising the DREAM Act and is a great advocate, the, actually the majority leader of Senator Reid is equally passionate about supporting the DREAM Act. So we're in, very good, in a very good place for being able to pass the DREAM Act separately if we have to do it. Of course, we don't want to have to do it. And you're, the work that you do, hopefully we can, we can pass comprehensive immigration reform and have a DREAM Act and have everything that we want. I just want to end by saying um, one more time, um, repeating what all of you guys have, what all the people here have been saying, how very um, much it means for a staff person to hear from you and to hear the actual stories. Because what happens is if you're a member of Congress, you be, and you're, or even if you're in the staff of Congress, you become more and more isolated from communities. <clears throat> even people that came from those communities become isolated, they don't hear enough. And these things become, these kinds of issues become abstractions. They don't, they might even know the stories from their past, but they don't, but, in, but unless you're bringing it to them today and saying, look, remember, remember, these are people that you might have met growing up, these are people that, that matter, um, then, you know, then we, we really um, will lose our, our momentum. And the fact that you're here, as Frank said, at the exact perfect time is very important, and I applaud you for making the effort. Thank you. Thank you, Frank, Josh, Tracy, Karen. Um, we have a, a little bit of time for some questions, uh, and now is just really a great opportunity. Uh, if you're unclear about anything, if you're unsure about how to say something tomorrow, uh, when you're meeting with your member of Congress, um, now is the time to ask the question. And how about that? Um, there are a lot of good things about I would like to acknowledge there are a lot of good things about this strike back, but uh, however, there are still a lot of loopholes in it. Um, 
you know, like the Filipino community has been hit hard with immigration stuff, from airport screeners, Cueva family, to the ERIRA Act. Um, how do, what's the process of making sure if what you're saying is it's not a perfect bill, how do you make it perfect and what's the process of getting to that? Because apparently there's a lot of immigrants that will still be um, falling into the cracks and um, when we talk about immigration stuff, this isn't the first time from the 1800s to now. It's there's, um, we have to make sure we keep on fighting for that to make sure that it really represents our community and we know what's best for our community. We see it every day. So I'd like to hear the process of how to correct those loopholes. Even if it's not now, well, how do we do it in the future? Mm -hmm. Great question. Well, I tell you, it's much easier to make the smaller fixes once you get the big thing through and then you can focus on that. So whether it's part of the bill pointing out who gets left out and telling their stories and trying to convince members of Congress to change the bill. As you know, uh, there's an amendment process that people have an opportunity to put amendments both bad and good. So we have to defend against the bad things and also try to work the good things. So if you have specific amendments, when you are meeting with members, you should lay out what you like to see fit. The challenge is this though, because I will tell you that a lot of members of Congress, both Democrat and Republican, would rather not to have to vote on this at all. They're looking at 2008 election. There's a concern about who's gonna get the White House. The Democrats barely have the House and the Senate. The Republicans want that back. And many of the Democrats who got elected this time, some of them ran on somewhat anti-immigrant platforms. They are looking over their shoulders. And they don't want to have to vote on something that they're going to be tacked on later. And immigration is one of the most hot button issues now. So we need to not just spend our time pointing out all the flaws, because then that sends a message to the members that, well, why should we bother? Because if we pass this, you're not going to be happy. So either way, I'm safe for not voting on it at all. So you have to be very careful with your message. What you support, that you think it needs to be fixed now, that as Frank said, the raids, everything else, we cannot wait two or three more years because if it doesn't pass this year, we're looking at two or three more years. So I, I, so I think that's important to know. Thank you. Okay. Um, Can you just come up to the mic if you have any question? Can you set the mic a little bit that way? Come on, the mic. I'm not sure that I'll be able to be here for, I know you guys are doing Advocacy 101, but now that I've been Hill staff for a whopping two months, I, I wanted to sit down and sort of tell folks what I would do differently if I were back in your shoes. So I'll, I'll tell you that Hill staffers have much shorter attention span than I ever realized. <laughs> Um, so I would, my recommendation to you guys is to keep it concise. Um, I would probably try not to make more than three points total and make it very simple. Um, whatever you bring for them to read, I would also, well, I mean, it's probably a little too late for material development now, but I, I would try to keep that simple and short to the point as well. Um, and certain, I and I mentioned that because I think Karen's points are dead on. You're often, unless you're talking to committee staff, and that's a little bit different because there you actually have people who have expertise in the area. But if you're talking to staff in the personal offices, they deal with a lot of other issues other than immigration. Um, the range of expertise that they have on immigration is going to be all over the place. Some folks have a lot of knowledge from having worked on this issue previously. Other folks especially in the House, because again, the Democratic majority is you there, don't necessarily have expertise on any of the issues, and certainly not on something as complex as immigration. So oftentimes, you're going to be in the position of teaching them something about immigration. And as you know, it's, it's always easier to teach people when you're short and to, concise and to the point. So I would just um, try to keep those points in mind as you're meeting with folks tomorrow. Okay. Hi, um, I'm Benjamin Gisman. I'm uh, from LA with the uh, Filipino American Service Group Incorporated, and I'm also with the National Alliance for Filipino Veterans Equity. Um, I think my question is for Josh, because um, 
Josh's analysis of the Dream Act as part of Strive, but also kind of, as it's a standalone bill too, right? Um, is very similar to kind of the confusion that we're trying to deal with in the Filipino community, particularly around the Filipino um, Veterans Family Reunification Act. Um, a lot of Filipino groups have sort of come under pressure for just supporting the Equity Act, which would you know, um, take away the Rescission Act and, and all of these things, and not supporting comprehensive immigration reform when in fact NAFA, some of the other groups have been you know, supportive of Strive. And I guess my question is, is the analysis that you kind of put out there around the DREAM Act, how we can support Strive, um, also can we kind of use that as a framework as, as we talk about the things that Filipinos are also caring about, whether it's comprehensive immigration reform and the Filipino uh, Veterans Family Reunification Act? I, um, possibly, yes. <laughs> um, the thing is that in, um, I mean, and every, every bill is slightly different, and you, what you need to do is you need to figure out, in terms of, you need to figure out is, what are the chances? Are the chan what are the chances that it will pass as part of comprehensive immigration reform, and then what are the chances that comprehensive immigration reform falls by the wayside, that you still will be able to, to have, it, have it pass separately? Um, and with the DREAM Act, we made that calculation because there's so much commitment to the DREAM Act separately, and there's been so much education up until now. I have to say, you know, I do worry about the kind of response that we're getting now in terms of people talking about them in a way as though they were com competitive with each other. And I worry that if, we, if people do not bring up the DREAM Act separately and say, look, we want you to support the DREAM Act, I worry that people, that, that we could then find a situation where comprehensive immigration reform doesn't pass, but it'll be too late to really get that motivation and, and to be, have built, you know, done the education that we need in order to pass the DREAM Act. So that's why it's important for people to bring up the DREAM Act now. And I think probably you have to do the same thing because, because um, other legislation can easily get lost. There's a lot, 700 pages in the DREAM Act and it, almost every provision is something that somebody wanted in there. And so if you have something that you want to make sure that it passes, and you don't want it to be dropped off at the last minute, you need to be doing separate, a separate education effort on that. And you need to be telling people, you know, you need to be telling people about that as a priority as well. I don't know if it answers your question. Okay, um, one more question. If there's another one or two more questions, if you come up to the mic, please. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Catherine. I'm from uh, the Chicago affiliate of NACASEC at the FCC. And um, as you might have heard, recently there was a terrible raid um, in Chicago where they detained over 100 shoppers, including um, families and children, in a shopping mall. And um, I was wondering what you suggest we can do to stop the raids while this is being debated, the immigration debate that's going on. What can we do in the meantime? <laughs> I think, honestly, stopping the raids, achieving that is going to be very difficult. And the effort to raise voices around the country is growing tremendously in its power. So whether it's New Bedford, Massachusetts, or Chicago, or all over the country, the effects of the raids on families and communities are becoming so powerful that now local governments are beginning to stand up and say, not in our backyard. So um, this is a bottom-up movement that could eventually achieve success. Uh, but it, that, that's where it comes from, and it's because of the people who are close to it and experience it. Uh, I, I, I happen to see the effect that the New Bedford raid had on Senator Kennedy because of the great work that the Ali and Mira, the community groups did. He came back to Washington, and he was different. He was changed by that experience. So um, these are awful situations and they're teachable moments where the cruelties of our immigration policy become very human and very real for people. So uh, I think that while we have to be uh, humble about what we're up against, I think we have to be aggressive in continuing to make the calls for a stop to the raise. And it's like, you know, which which straw will finally, you know, break the camel's back and shift so that it actually there's a moratorium on raids. 
that's not going to happen anytime soon, but if the movement continues to gain strength, it will happen. At the grassroots organizations, I think everyone here is from grassroots. What can we literally do when we go back to our community on Wednesday? I have to say, I've never seen in my 25 years of work so much sophisticated, heartfelt advocacy and organizing that's going on in local communities that is going on now. So I think that uh, we are on the verge of a new breakthrough in our movement that is the grassroots is driving. So I think first we just have to say congratulations, incredible work is going on, and we're always thinking about what we haven't done. Sometimes we should acknowledge what is being done. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we, um, the main thing that I think that we need to keep doing, it's not so much the tactics or the strategies, it's, um, it's to take risks. It's to take risks, because we're not going to change immigration policy that affects vulnerable and marginalized people of color who don't have a lot of political power unless we take big risks. Thank you. Okay, for everybody who's okay back there, there's going to be some really exciting videos. It's going to be a multimedia presentation. Okay, so last two questions. Last, last two questions, one. Okay. And, then, uh, and then we're going to move to the exciting videos. Uh, but this is very important because this is all of the information that you're going to need for your visits tomorrow. So go ahead. Okay. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Ernie Ramos and I come from Miami, Florida, where the bad and the ugly of immigration reform happens daily, starting with the wet foot, dry foot uh, policy of Cubans on the one hand and the deportation, utmost deportation of Haitians uh, on the other, plus the raids on Asian Americans. And uh, probably I, I can uh, focus this question uh, on, on Frank, because you did say something about uh, let us speak truth to power. And Karen also had mentioned about the election 2000 is just around the corner. In my experience in working also, Tracy, I work on the Hill too, and I'm now retired. In my experience, uh, uh, better or good experiences that uh, oftentimes uh, members of Congress uh, don't see the, themselves to community organizations without looking at the number of voters that they're going to get. Because almost 90% of these members of Congress want to return to the seat of power. And so Frank, if you can address this registration of voters on one hand and immigration reform on the other, so at least we can sort of uh, create the impetus for all of us Asian American voters, especially because I know that the Latino voters are speaking about it, are, are urging themselves to really create that kind of impetus. So would you be so kind as to uh, create that kind of scenario for us Asian American voters? Sure, as an Asian American organizer, I'd love to. <laughs> um, I, I will say this, that, um, and, and I know this a, one of our great leaders said it so well. This isn't just about immigration. This immigration reform is part of immigrant and ethnic communities claiming their rightful place at the table of American opportunity. And that is going to have many forms. Immigration reform is a giant step forward for recognition, it's, but it's only a stepping stone to more opportunities for more people in many different ways. I actually think that you are, and we are all part of a 21st century progressive movement that hasn't quite gelled yet, but it will gel. And so that immigration reform is part of it, mobilizing and registering voters and turning out voters so that political power is felt at the polls and many groups here, see Fred Sow from the Illinois Coalition, they do a model project in mo get encouraging citizenship and voter registration and people getting to the polls now so that when the Illinois Coalition goes and talks to members of Congress in their area about immigration reform, the members of Congress know that the Illinois Coalition produces voters in their district. It's not either or, it's both and, and it complements each other. And, that's, and then we're going to keep building it. 
we're gonna there will be different expressions and different issues. So I'm very optimistic about our long-term prospects if people stay at it. And not everyone's gonna do the same thing and not everyone's gonna agree on every issue, but if we have a collective sense that what we're doing is building power to change policy that will deliver opportunity for people who are shut out, then that cause will unite us even as we differ over some specifics. Well, so uh, just uh, for your information, after this, uh, and du during and after dinner, we'll have a small group discussion. I think that's a really great uh, question. You know, issue and how we link to our electoral power and improve and building community power. I think that's a great question. Maybe we can have a more dialogue among people. You guys are the answer. You guys are the activists. You guys are making the history. And you guys are making the movement, the community. So you guys know everything. You guys should have a great discussion. I think that would be great. So we have uh, two more, uh, two last questions and uh, go to the next program. Thank you. Okay. So thank you very much for all the information um, on what you're seeing on the Hill right now. Um, I was curious because I understood that many of the positive provisions of the Strive Act are contingent upon increased border enforcement and interior enforcement. That is to say, like making the raids worse, making the deaths on the border worse. And so I was just sort of curious about how um, you're reconciling those kind of differing you know, points of view or those challenges. Because on the one hand, we have families that are waiting 20 years and so forth, but at the same time, people are dying on the border, people are being deported as the stories we heard earlier today. And so, you know, we just, I want to hear how you are thinking about border enforcement and militarization because it impacts all of us. Well, uh, a lot of what's in this drive back in terms of border is what we call smarter border enforcement that would actually be more humane. And they're actually, uh, you know, because the reality is, I think people often get in this debate of, well, this is horrible border enforcement, but the reality is we already have horrible border enforcement going on. So what we're trying to do is have a border enforcement that is going to not result in deaths at the border, and a system that is going to not force people to have to come that way. So let me give you two pictures. One is, the point of comprehensive reform is to change the flow of illegal immigration into a flow of legal immigration. If we have the right incentives and ability for people to come here legally, they won't have to take the risks that they're taking now to cross the borders in these incredibly hostile places. So that's number one. Let's fix the root problem. Number two, we fought for and got in the Scribe Act uh, many provisions that would require training of border enforcement, that would require a report, that would require uh, human, right, uh, hu human rights understanding. That, you know, so there are things, if you look in the 700-page bill, in the board enforcement, and I'm not saying that everything in the board enforcement is something that I like. There are some things that we would not want to be there, but there are a lot of things that seek to actually balance out and fix some of those problems. But it's a very important question. But the, the one thing I, I will say is we have to be realistic about what we can get past and go back and try to fix those other things when we can. But the reality is if you wait for a perfect bill, it will never come. And meanwhile, people are dying at the border. The, the, the one thing I want to add is, um, because I would be remiss if I didn't, is on the due process side of things. Um, you know, strive, the strive value, the White House negotiator is the secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. You can imagine what's in his bill. Okay? I haven't seen it. I'm told it's worse than Sensenbrenn. So that's what we're looking at as the alternative. We're looking at can we move Spry forward, or are we going to end up sinking to the depths of what we are facing with a team that is led by the Secretary of Department of Homeland Security, who is not a friend of due process or civil liberties, as we've seen over and over again, and is who is responsible for the harsh raids that are happening and what's going on at the border. Okay, one more question. Hi, um, I guess my question will be the last question for tonight, but um, as a member of FISH organization from, uh, FISH from Chicago, um, we were wondering that exactly what financial aid um, the DREAM Act is going to provide, because when we were visiting our congressmen, some um, congressmen were um, telling us that some of the people in their district were stating that they were afraid that the um, 
undocumented students will be competing with the Americans for the financial aid. And so that congressman, a lot of congressmen said that they feared on uh, voting for this, um, for the GINA. So can you clarify on how we should talk about this tomorrow when we meet our legislators? Good, good question. Very good question. Thank you for asking that. The, um, um, to, to begin with, remember that the DREAM Act doesn't provide benefit, doesn't really provide any kind of financial aid assistance to anybody who's undocumented. It only apply, it provide, allows people to get any kind of financial aid after they are here legally, after they have changed their status to a legal status. The DREAM Act specifically um, does, has a provision, unfortunately, which we did not like, that says that the, even after they become legal, that the DREAM Act students will not be eligible for federal grants, primarily Pell Grants. So that means that they're treated worse than all the other students who are here legally, even though by that time they will be here legally. Um, they will be eligible for the more inexpensive, non-competitive types of assistance like student loans that people have to pay back or work study that they have to work for. Um, and they also, once they're here legally, they also will be eligible to get in state tuition. So, so it's a big step forward, but they're still going to have to fight harder than any, all the other students that they're graduating with. Okay, thank you for asking the question. Thanks, to you. Okay, thank you for on PBS on May 15th, so it is a film sponsored by a public broadcast system, and you can watch it on your television, actually, um, on May 15th, or you should check the website to see what date it will uh, show in your city. But um, I appreciated, actually, Karen's comment, because one of the issues that isn't resolved in some of the legislation put forward is, is the due process issue. And I think it's really an issue that people often think about is, is about those who've committed crimes in this country. But we really feel that it's about um, those living in poverty, uh, families being torn apart, and those who also should receive just and humane immigration reform. And for us, it's about, um, in our communities, about Cambodians who've been deported, many to countries um, of which they have tried to escape persecution. So for both Manny and I who came to this country as refugees, it's a very important issue to us. And so I'm actually going to introduce Manny Uch. He is in the film and has been traveling across the country to speak about the film and its impact and has really grown to become an activist and uh, spend whatever time he has left with us on this issue. Oh, oh, I think we have a great video. It's about our life, our community member, our brothers, sisters, their life they struggle. So if you guys can kind of sit down a little bit, and if you can kind of pee, just kind of go out quietly and come back quietly. And just sit, please uh, pay attention to our uh, the introduction. We have a great uh, documentary. Uh, this is a lifetime opportunity. Okay, okay thank you. Who's, uh, who's uh, sleepy? <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, my name is Manny Ucha. Um, I'm a subject in the documentary and it follows my life also. And um, I, I, 
you know, my work is around this documentary. It's uh, showing it around high school and local community and at-risk kids and basically try to move the, uh, the community to take action and, and try to change the law, either let the law change you or be part of changing the law. And I chose to uh, be part of uh, changing the law. So uh, can I introduce the documentary now? Okay, so it's Sentence Home uh, trailer. It's rough cut, so here it is.
you know, what is a bad kid? You know, I grew up, you know, thinking I'm not a bad kid at all. Even though, you know, you run from the police, you get in trouble, you go to school, you get kicked out of school, I still, you know, you don't, and you don't consider yourself bad because everybody in the neighborhood is the same way. Guys my age and stuff, we're just, you know, stuck in the system. You know, it's a revolving door. You know, I'm ex you know, I'm always going to be ex and everything I feel out. for SALT, South Asian American Leaders of Tomorrow. SALT is a national nonprofit organization that seeks to empower the South Asian community to get more civically and politically engaged. There are 2.5 million South Asians in the country today. And between 1990 and 2000, the fastest growing Asian immigrant communities were Indian, Pakistani, Sri Lankan, and Bangladeshi. Um, the South Asian community is predominantly made up of immigrants, and since 9-11, there have been particular policies, such as special registration, which have endangered community members. Special registration was a program after September 11, which asked men from specific countries, including those in South Asia, and who were over the age of 16, to report to immigration officials. The clip that you are about to see is from Whose Children Are These, a documentary by New York-based director Teresa Tanjan. The film highlights stories of South Asian children and the effects of special registration on them and their family members. If you would like to screen this and you're interested, please come see me later. Thank you. U.S. citizen or green card holder here. April 9, 2003, my father went to special registration in the morning. He woke up at 5. He wanted to be there early and finish early and come back home and just get over with, you know. And um, so my mom said before leaving that she didn't say bye to them. And he said, what for? I'm coming back. You know, they'll hear everything when I come back. And that day I had an interview for a college at Mount St. Vincent for a uh, um, pre-mac program. That's a very prestigious program. I mean, you need a high average, volunteer services. I got the news when I went to the interview. 
uh, from the admission officers that I was admitted in the program. So I was really happy. I was, you know, I was really happy. I worked hard for it. So I came home. I couldn't wait to tell my, you know, tell everyone, my dad, my mom, when a phone call came. I felt something was wrong, you know, and uh, he said that, Navila, you know, I don't think I'm coming back home. because the whole school was supposed to be there and my mom told me the case was not, you know, right there. My uncle kept bugging me. That's what he did. He was like, you gotta go register. He felt that this is the law and this is what they are saying that must be done. You know, we must comply. And I guess I just looked out my mind about my status. Like, I really didn't... At a, at a point, I just felt like, oh, I'm living my everyday life. We met at the McDonald's across 26 Federal Plaza Immigration Naturalization Service. I got there at around 7.50. And we were on the third floor uh, and we waited uh, for several hours before he was interviewed. And I just seen a lot of Muslim, Arab countrymen. And they just had fear in their face and hearts and just walking around and just holding their heads like they don't know what's going to happen to them, what's going on while I'm just sitting there with my books with, with Liz. And then periodically he would, you know, ask me again and again, Liz, why am I here again? Why are they doing this again? And, you know, am I going to get out in time? I've got basketball practice. And, you know, and I just would look at him and, it made me so angry inside and so frustrated because I did not have an answer to give to somebody who was already confused. And I was like, Mom, you shouldn't be here. You know, there's no reason why you should be here. I wasn't really concerned about myself because I knew I didn't have a bad record. He was seen by an interviewer on the third floor. Uh, they asked him for his name, you know, all his family information, his email address. Um, uh, they photographed him, they fingerprinted him, uh, and then they asked us to wait again. And then uh, they said that they had to take him to the 10th floor. And I said, well, then I'm going with him. And he said, no, attorneys are allowed. And I said, this is ridiculous. I said, you are taking a ten teenager to the 10th floor. I said, this is totally inappropriate. And so he said, you can wait outside on the 10th floor, but you can't go in. There was a huge steel double door that he took Muhammad through. And then I waited um, outside, you know, at the elevators to make sure that they didn't take him anywhere without me seeing him. Once I went up there, I seen people, they took a whole bunch of people at times, at a time. They took them and they put them in one room where it's covered with glass where you can see all the ashes. There's a, there's a, there's another room where it's a, it's a very tiny room. They just put you in there for maybe a hour, maybe a couple hours, and there's a video camera right in your face. I don't know what's that used for psychological effects or whatnot. I'm not sure. I know English. I can speak to them, I can understand them, but when I look down across the hall, I seen people that, I mean, there were shackles there, I seen people that were just being interviewed by people who were just screaming at them, and they didn't have a clue what they were talking about. There were repeated questions, and the funny thing was, they didn't have any translators there. They were being screamed at and yelled at. I mean, it's really unfair to those people because they came to work hard and to make a living. They came just to live liberty, I guess. To live freely. And just because somebody that looks like them has done something, maybe, maybe not, they shouldn't be penalized for this.
have seven left. Yeah. Um, I wish uh, we had a whole night to watch this powerful documentary, but uh, because we have a time uh, restriction. Uh, as a f uh, final documentary, I'd like to introduce uh, Jessica Lee. Uh, she introduced Youth Produce a Documentary, uh, titled April 10, 2006. It's about the marches and uh, youth movement. My name is Jessica Lee and I'm a member of the Korean Research Center of Los Angeles and also a member of the Youth Group Orange. I'm here to introduce a documentary about the DREAM Act, Development, Relief, Education for Min Alien Minds Act. As many of you know, DREAM Act is a bill that gives undocumented students who came here with them when they were young and stayed out of trouble with the right and opportunity to experience education beyond high school. DREAM Act is very personal to me. I grew up with a friend who was undocumented yet full of hopes and dreams. It affected me whenever I saw her struggle with her future plans. She had such big goals for herself, but she had very little chance to achieve them. Now that it's almost time for me to go off to college, I see more of my friends struggle every day. They pay double and triple the tuition that citizen and undocumented residents pay. Dream Act is all about giving them a fair chance. This, document, this next documentary is about a fellow Orange member's experience at a rally on April 10th. Last year on April 10th, more people marched on the streets on a single issue than ever in American history. The April 10th rally was a huge movement nationwide that allowed everyone to speak up for, their, for the Dream Act. Thousands of parents and students marched endlessly to show their concerns. Hopefully this document speaks to you and helps you understand the passion and hearts of the students. So next time someone talks to you about the DREAM Act, stop, listen, and act. Thank you. April 10th, 2006. This day was when I had to face one of my fears, public speaking. But to my surprise, I wasn't nervous at all until I got on stage. One by one, speakers spoke their beautiful words. I started to feel real small. When I was in front of the podium and the mic, I couldn't say a word. The crowd was still cheering, and I didn't know what to do. The MC told me to just start speaking, but I couldn't. I wanted them to listen to me. I spoke a few words from my speech, and I heard the mayor of Los Angeles whisper, louder, louder. I projected my voice toward the mic, and I thought I was pretty loud. But after seeing the recording, I couldn't be heard at all. I wondered why all these people were cheering for me, even if they couldn't hear me. Dream. That's what most of us do in our sleep. Dream. That's what we live for. Dream. That's life. When I first came to this country called America, I was nine. My family and I moved here to experience new things and have a new life. A new life with a good education for everyone. I believe that education is the best thing anyone can have. With lack of my English skills, I attended Bellagio Newcomer School. This is a school for students who just came to America. Because they were students who were in the same position as me, I didn't feel awkward at all. We talked about our favorite colors, our favorite food, and most importantly, our dreams. We all came here with big dreams of achieving success. But unfortunately, not everyone is blessed with that opportunity. Some, some of my classmates were undocumented. Because of that, they felt discouraged and without much hope for the future. They began not doing well in school and dropping out. It affects me to see these students take that road because they feel like they don't have any other choices. It affects me because I am their friend and an immigrant too. But we all need to know that it's not over yet. We have hope in the DREAM Act. We have opportunities. 
With the DREAM Act, we can open a new road for the students who are in this situation. It revives hope, it revives lives, and it revives them. DREAM Act allows students to dream. It allows students to achieve their dreams. And last of all, it allows students to live and succeed. I still want to talk to my friends about our favorite colors, our favorite food, and our dreams. In this place, the adults call Land of Opportunities, I believe that students should be included to experience these opportunities. from um, Kiran Ahuja with the National Asian Pacific American Women's Forum and Deepa Ayer, uh, Executive Director of the South Asian American Leaders of Tomorrow. And they're going to leave us with some closing thoughts and then I'm going to have Mona come and talk about some uh, logistics and housekeeping and where we're going to get to eat dinner. It's like the solo cup rally right here. Right? He's like, I'm going with it. I know everyone's tired, this is going to be really quick. Um, we just kind of wanted to close out. There's a lot of information that, that's been thrown at us. Um, we've got a big day tomorrow, so we want to conserve that energy and get some food. Um, much needed sustenance. So just a couple of things to sort of wrap up kind of what you've been hearing today. Um, and we just kind of wanted to pull that all together. So I think some things that I heard um, that I think would really resonate with me and hopefully with you are one, that this is like perfect timing. Right? What's, what's already happened with the House bill? What's planning to happen in the Senate? The fact that we're here um, in uh, Washington, D.C., meeting with members of Congress, when this is at the forefront of their minds. So just keep that in mind that this is about perfect timing. And a couple of things around um, messaging, like how to ensure, to, you know, to make sure that your message sticks. And you know, when you hear about all this stuff, I mean, the, the two important things are the message and the messenger. So we already know we got the messenger, right? It's all of us that are here in this room. So that, that we have. It's the message. And I want all of you, if you can look in your packet. Is it too loud? Sorry. So you can look in your packet. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Okay. If you can look in your packet um, for uh, talking points. Um, it should be at the end. It's, it's uh, pink. And uh, it's, I think on the left side of the packet. In the back, in the very back. So these are some talking points that were put together for you. It's a lot of information here. Um, you're going to have some time to look at it with your group during dinner. Uh, but this is your message. And on the very top, it talks about building America's future together, immigration, immigration reform now. So that's part of the big message is that, you know, what Karen talked about tonight, what other speakers have talked about, is that the, the immigration system is broken. And we, it needs to be fixed. And so as you think about some of your points, um, that sort of, you know, is the, is the overall message. And oftentimes when they talk about, you know, uh, Tracy had mentioned that it's really important when you talk to these staffers um, that they don't really have a great attention span, right? I mean, you know, one, they may not know the information very well, and this idea of like three points, that's it. When you, go, when you come together in your group, think about the three points that you want to make Clear and concise. Um, it doesn't have to be, you know, there's a lot of stats in there. And I think, you know, one thing that you have to remember that people are talking about is that people care about your stories. Like, they don't care about a bunch of numbers. I mean, it's great to back it up with numbers, but they care about your stories. And we all have, I mean, what we just saw in these documentaries are just so moving. Like, I can't help but get emotional every time I see, um, you know, I see these documentaries. And maybe it's not your own personal story, but I bet you know somebody that you can tell from a personal perspective because you're a constituent from their district and they want to hear that. Another thing that I think was really helpful for me the first time that I went around and I talked to members of Congress and their staffers was that, and I, and I know one of the speakers talked about it, is that you own the hallways in Congress. You own them. So go with confidence and then you own 
<laughs> those, those offices, the furniture in those offices, the clothes they're wearing probably because you know, your taxes are paid for their salaries. I mean, really come with that perspective that they should be listening to you. They should really be listening to you. And so I know for some of you it might be a little nerve-wracking, but the idea is, is that you all really own that space. So claim it. Um, a couple of other things that, you know, in, in D.C. that they talk about is, like, everyone loves to talk about values, right? Like, you know, we can have our taglines. So a couple of taglines to remember that you've been hearing a lot about is pro-family, pro-worker, <coughs> pro-citizenship, humane, just, fair. So think about some of these uh, words that you can put into your conversations um, your conversations with the staffers. And also the fact that we're actually bringing an Asian face to this issue, right? An API face to this issue. And that is so important. I mean, this is a collective effort of so many other immigrants um, in this country. And also not only that, in your talking points, it talks about, um, I don't remember exactly where this is, but um, I think there was a statistic that was put in there that I thought was really very telling. Um, and actually, it's on your second page where it says past comprehensive immigration reform now. It talks about most people in this country are interested in fixing this immigration system. It's not just immigrants. So, you know, it's not just about us, it's about most people feel that there are problems with the system. So, those are just a couple of things to think about um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, and I guess just. So just a couple of other things as far as what's in the packet that you've been hearing about. And there's a lot of information the talking points is. The White House plan is bad, right? We all know that. The White House plan, the White House plan is bad. It's anti-family. It's anti-worker. It's anti-immigrant. So that's like, you know, in the sense of like remembering all this information. Um, about workers' rights, you want to stop the raids. And we see how it hurts families, and I, and I thought we had a really good perspective of whether that will actually happen. But the point is sort of telling those personal stories. Um, and that the workers, you know, contribute to our economy. I mean, you know, it's like thinking about what these members of Congress and staffers care about and trying to talk in a way that's going to get them to listen. Um, also, the DREAM Act. We care about the future of our children. Is it really their fault? You know, just sort of thinking about ways to talk about it. Are we, gonna, are we going to penalize innocent children in this country? And are we going to create a second class citizenship for the fact that they can't pursue their education? And finally, we talked about this, a path to citizenship and to legalization. And that is so critically important. Um, that immigrants in this country want legal status to be here and to contribute. Um, and to not live in fear. And we want comprehensive immigration reform now. So these are just some things to think about. And Adidas is going to talk about a few of these other um, pieces and some, and some take home take homes as well mm -hmm. once you leave here. Thanks, Karen. Um, so as as you heard, you know, earlier today, the pieces of legislation and policies here in DC keep shifting and changing so much. So that's why um, we kind of stick to just the values and sort of key core principles um, instead of kind of adding all the, the lingo about policies and legislation that really do change quite often. So Karen talked about um, two of those, legalization and worker rights. And I just wanted to cover um, two more. And then um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, as she said, kind of the take home messages once we leave here tomorrow. So another core principle is family. And you know, when I guess one, one way of thinking, I know you're going to get some training um, later on today or tonight about how to do these visits, but I often think about it as story, statistic, and ask. Those are the three you know, components when you go in with something. So of course you want to start with a personal story, and I think with family, we all, each of us has one. Um, if we're not ourselves immigrants, we are children of immigrants, so we have a story. Um, statistic or fact. Um, there are 1.5 million visa applications by Asian Americans that are stuck in the backlog, and that's in your talking points, 1.5 million. And then finally, the ask, what do we want the congressional member to do? We want them to make sure that there are more family visas. We want them to make sure that they preserve family sponsorship categories, and we want them to clear the backlog. So if you think about
about it in that way, that could really help to kind of align what we want to say. Um, the, the last principle that I wanted to mention is, um, we, we often call it due process, but I really feel like it doesn't make, us make a lot of sense to regular folks. So, you know, I've taken to calling it just dignity. And a lot of times the way that you want to think about this is um, really the, the two films that we just saw, um, where we saw Southeast Asians and South Asians and so many other ethnic and immigrant communities who are being put into detention and deportation proceedings and they often don't have access to attorneys. They often are stuck there indefinitely. So we want, again, dignity. And so for these individuals, we want them to have the rights that everyone else has. So again, starting with a personal story, and if you don't have one, to use some, something that you just saw today um, as a personal story to kind of harken back to. And then use a statistic or a fact. Um, we saw something about how many Cambodian Americans are stuck in deportation proceedings. Um, in addition, after September 11th, um, the detention deportation, deportations that happened to South Asians disproportionately affected that community, especially the Pakistanis and Bangladeshis, than ever before. And then finally, the ask. What do we want? We want due process. We want people to have access to lawyers, access to courts, um, the ability to make their case and to have it be heard. So those are the, the key principles behind reform that you could really um, use when you're talking to your legislators tomorrow. And then we all leave, right? And so what, what do we do you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday, or you know, nearing the weekend, and kind of memories of DC are receding in the back of your mind? Um, well, I know that one thing that Karen and I were saying earlier today is that really the struggle is going to continue well beyond this week. We heard it from you know, the panel of experts earlier today that this is going to be something that will go on in May, June, July. So we're really just kind of you know, starting to get ready for it. Um, so what I want to ask you all to do is to kind of take a pledge along the lines of the three points to just commit to doing three things when you go home. And make that pledge before you get on the bus or get in the car or get on the plane. Um, and it, it can be really simple things. And here are some suggestions. I know many of us here are with organizations. So one thing that you could do is to try to broaden your coalition beyond the Asian American community or the Southeast Asian community, the Korean community, the South Asian community, right? And to go well beyond it. So that's something that can be done so easily because as Kieran mentioned, there are a lot of people working on these issues all around the country. So broaden coalition. The second, um, thing that I would suggest that you do is, we talked a lot about, you know, Karen talked about we own the, that you all, we all own the halls of Congress. Well, I also believe that you own all of us national organizations that are convening you today. Um, challenge us. Tell us what you want us to do. Make sure that we are responsive to what you want in your local communities. Um, so I really want to make sure that you hear that message, because we don't often get it right in the beltway. So it's important that we hear from everyone out there in our communities. Similarly, follow up with your elected representatives. Same thing, when you're out of the Beltway, schedule a meeting with your district representative, your local representative, and say, you know, I met with so-and-so in your national office, and I want to reiterate the same message. And then finally, the last um, suggestion for a pledge you can make is more on an individual level, which is to really start to challenge the anti-immigrant sentiment that we're beginning to see and hear so much more loudly and visibly these days. Um, and that can mean you know, writing a letter to the editor of your local newspaper. It can mean starting to attend um, city council meetings and keep making your voice heard, asking about things like no raids in our backyard. So really kind of taking those individual steps um, in our local communities. So I'm going to stop there and I think turn it back to our wonderful MCs. But thank you and good luck tomorrow. Good luck. Thank you, Deepa and Kieran. Um, I just wanted to do a quick call out to some people from states that weren't here earlier. So, is is Texas in the house? <laughs> How about Virginia? Virginia in the house. Okay, um, I'm not sure about these states. I'm going to call them out because they're on our uh, registration list. Connecticut, Massachusetts. Kansas, Nevada, Arkansas. All right, Arkansas, New Jersey. New Jersey, Oregon, Michigan.
Michigan. All right, wave your hand back there. North Carolina. All right, Oklahoma. All right, Oklahoma. All right, great. And I also wanted to say that the Asian Pacific American Labor Alliance is in the house now. They are one of our convening organizations. So, um, uh, you guys, it's been incredible. I know it's been long, uh, but I'm going to turn it over to Morna now, and she's going to talk about uh, what this evening is going to look like and uh, at dinner. So, Morna. But thank you guys all for, for being here. So, we got time to So I'm just going to give some last minute, some last reminders. Um, if you have not registered yet, there are a bunch of you who may have come into the program late and we asked you to come straight upstairs. Please go back down to the registration table. Um, as a reminder, we're asking participants to contribute um, $15 towards materials and other fees that, to make this event happen. Um, so the next part is uh, dinner, which is very important. Um, it'll be actually downstairs in the fellowship hall. If you watch the signs, there are arrows pointing you down to where the fellowship hall is. And during dinner, we're hoping that you will meet in your legislative teams. And how you will know that is that on each table, there is a placard. On one side is an organization, and the other side are the states where they have set up legislative meetings. If you are with an organization, find the name of the organization. Or if you're not with an organization, find the state. Um, you'll sit together, you'll go through some of the talking points and the schedules for the day. Um, in your participant packets, actually, um, the green, there's um, a list of legislative visits that are scheduled. Um, once you get into your teams, you can discuss in more detail what that will be. Um, just really quickly for tomorrow as well, um, tomorrow is like we've been saying all day, all this has been preparation for tomorrow. Um, so. Legislative visits will start as early as 8 or 8.30, depending on when they're set up for your group. Um, and the only scheduled uh, event really is the, um, the noon rally at Taft Memorial Park. Um, from the house side of the Capitol, it's about like a 10, 15 minute walk. Um, so you want to give yourself plenty of time to get there. It's on, it's on the Senate side. It's on the Senate side, but the Senate side's a little bit closer. And it's on, it's uh, Tuff Memorial Park is north of the Capitol between New Jersey and First Northwest. There are maps. If you again look to your green, there is um, there should be a map indicating um, key points uh, where your how most of your legislative visits will be in relation to the Tuff Memorial. Okay. So. And I, one thing I, you guys can do immediately is if you have friends in the area, call them tonight and get their commitments to show up tomorrow. We have buses coming in from out of town, from New York, from Philadelphia, from all over. And um, there are a lot of other people from the East Coast who are going to be joining us and a whole contingent from Maryland and Virginia as well. So it's going to be really exciting. So um, uh, does anybody have any questions about the logistics, about where you're staying? Uh, yeah, talk to Morna. Uh, and then before I let Morna sit down, I'm going to just ask everybody to give her a round of applause because Morna. them and all of their board members and all their staff uh, for making this happen so and their affiliate organizations in the three cities so thank you for having so I don't think that we're going to have a chance to do all of that tomorrow um, so I just wanted to take a minute to do that today so um, without further ado everyone uh, could go downstairs and find your state or find your organization and get your dinner thank you everybody